I'll try, try to. Right. Think. So, yeah. Okay. Now this should be recording now. So, um, I'm, let's start. Uh, right. So, hello everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, so our speaker today, we only have one talk today. So Ryan's uh, the only speaker for today, and he's going to teach us the difference between a circle and a square. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, thanks, Jorgo, uh, for inviting me in the introduction. Um, I'd like to first of all thank Lucas Lavoyer de Miranda for pointing out that the difference between circle and square is that one has edges. So maybe this will make the rest of the talk a bit redundant. But uh, let's see if we can get a little bit more than just edges out of this. So the the second part of the title was the relationship between Fourier series and multiplier problems. And that's where circles and squares start to be a bit more annoying than just having corners. So um, I'll just begin with a quick recap of what the situation looks like for Fourier series in one dimension. So Fourier series on the torus for one dimension. And you can think of the torus as R mod Z. And for all intents and purposes, that's just 0, 1 with periodic boundary conditions. So uh, given a function, if we associate with it a Fourier series, Fourier coefficients, fk, e to the 2 pi i, k, uh, x. And I'm using the, not that this matters too much, but the convention is to integrate the, to keep the 2 pi's inside the exponentials. So like so. So we've got a function f of x and we've got this Fourier series and we'd like to know what the relationship between between the two are. So a number of nice things that can be said about this is so for example if f is a Hölder type function then you get oh sorry let me just introduce the notation here. We're going to treat the partial sums from k minus n to n. So if you've got a Hölder type function, then you get uniform conversions. Um, this doesn't actually work for continuous functions. Now that's a result of the Boisraymond, that being continuous is not enough for uniform convergence. Um, if you're continuous, what you do get is almost everywhere convergence. And that's a result of uh, Carlson with an E, it's not to be confused with the other theorem from complex analysis, and Hunt. And we're interested in the case of LP convergence. So when does S these partial sums of these series converge to F in LP um, for P between 1 and infinity? We're going to have to discount one uh, because of the result of Kolmogorov that has a divergent series, even if you're in L1. So I'm going to focus on, on the case of LP because that's the interesting one for, say, Sobolev spaces and that kind of, uh, that family of non-based spaces. So the main tool for tackling this is the observation that the following two statements are equivalent. Uh, when p is in the desired range. So the first is that for every f in LP, you have this norm convergence. And the second is that these, if you treat Sn as a linear operator from LP to LP, the operator norms are uniformly bounded. So if you put the implication this way, this um, is that, that implication is just the uniform boundedness principle. So if it's convergence, it's bounded for every f, so you get a uniform bound. The interesting implication, which is this one, requires that trigonometric polynomials are dense in LP, which is, oops, that's true, but it's important because it means that this kind of result is kind of restricted to um, uh, Fourier analysis. And we'll talk a bit more about more general classes of eigenfunctions that aren't just exponentials at the end. So this is almost what we know for, for one dimension. So which is it? Do they converge? 
and whoa, sorry, sorry about that. The answer to that uh, is that for p not equal to one or infinity, these partial sums are uniformly bounded. And therefore you get convergence in LP. And this is a class of result using the boundedness of the conjugate function or the Hilbert transform. So this is completely sorted for Fourier series in, in one dimension for LP. So moving up a dimension, what happens on Tn, which again is just uh, the additive group, when n is greater than or equal to 2? Well, this introduces immediately an ambiguity in the way in which we choose the partial sums. So one way that we could decide to do the partial sums is as follows. We again look at Fourier coefficients and their corresponding exponentials, now using a dot product, and we decide to truncate them um, cubically. So this is like using the L1 norm on Zn. So if this is the lattice, um, where we're picking up k, a zoomed in lattice, we do our partial sums by drawing around boxes or cubes in higher dimensions around the points. Another option that could also, it's also plausible, is to take the circular truncations. So same thing in terms of the actual series, but the, the choice of indices in K now uses the L2 norm on Zn. So this would, if we draw the lattice again, this would amount to using spheres or circles to try to pick out the points. Uh, now you might think that this doesn't matter and that they're just, the convergence shouldn't be affected, but that's not quite what happens. And the two, two cases are actually quite extreme. So just to see a bit what's going on, we've got similar results to the one dimensional case where the convergence of the partial sums, the square ones, say, in LP is equivalent to the uniform boundedness of the square summation operator, the square truncation operators, um, as maps from LP to LP. And similarly, you've got over here that the circular uh, partial sum truncations converge oh, oops. if and only if you've similarly got a uniform bound on the circular operators. Okay. So the, the proof is, is the same. In fact, it's more general. You can use Connick or bochner riesmann but we're going to stick with these simpler um, kinds of truncations. So first, let's discuss the square case. So let me just maybe put it up to that. We can rewrite these um, partial sums as a convolution operator using the square Dirichlet kernel. So the Dirichlet kernel of x is just the sum of the exponentials without any Fourier coefficients in them. And this is taken over the, in the square mode of truncation, like above. This is similar to the one dimensional case, so you can also write as dnf, where the one dimensional case without the square brackets, so if you like dx1, is just k from n to n. Right. 
So this might be familiar if you've done any Fourier analysis. The important point to realize in the square case is that this Dirichlet kernel factors. So if you apply this to the endpoint and the end torus, you can write this as a product, an n-fold product of the individual one-dimensional Dirichlet kernels. Right, this is from the 1D case. So this allows us to establish the boundedness of these operators by using induction on the results that we establish for one dimension. So what we obtain is that for again one between P and infinity, these the square partial sums, that is the convolution operators, Uh, in the square case, LP, are uniformly bounded. So maybe a and this follows by just um, doing an induction on the n equals one result. So this means that we've solved again the problem for uh, greater n equals two. That the square truncation of f converges to f in LP. Again, provide that one less than p less than infinity. So you've got the one dimension and for higher dimensions, the square case works exactly the same. It just reduces to the one dimensional case. So, so what about the spherical or the circular truncation? Well, again, we could use a Dirichlet kernel and write the circular n as a circular kernel, convolution operator. Well, the Dirichlet kernel is going to be defined exactly the same way, just using this spherical truncation as before. But, and you can probably guess this, this doesn't factor. So there's no straightforward way to apply the one dimensional result to try to leverage this in higher dimensions. So rather than use the Dirichlet kernel, we're going to write, rewrite the partial sums yet again um, in this fashion. So we're going to sum over all k and z and we're going to take the Fourier coefficients and the exponentials as usual, but we only want to pick out the k's in the ball. So this, we add this weight factor. So this would just pick out the k's that lie in the ball of radius n. Um, and I've divide out the n to, um, to leave that the function is exactly the same. But they're, they're equivalent, these two things. So what we obtain here is almost a Fourier series, but with an extra weight. And um, these, these kinds of operators are called multipliers for the torus. So we say that a sequence, say a k, which is in L infinity of Zn, that's bounded sequence indexed on the lattice is a p multiplier if the operator ta which we define by weighting the Fourier expansion so this is spectral theory but for Fourier series is bounded as an operator from LP to LP. So we say that A, or more like the sequence A, lies in the space MP, and this A has an MP norm of the operator. So the norm of the multiplier, which is the sequence, is just going to be the norm of the operator it generates. 
So let's see if I can keep all of that in the picture. So we're, re we're rewriting the spherical kernel as a Fourier series with these weights, which are the, the ball. And generally speaking, we call those multipliers if they're bounded on LP. So this, for us, this turns the question of convergence of, a, of the circular truncations into a uniform bound on the operator norms, but that is a uniform bound on these multipliers. Okay, so this is a supremum over n. We didn't put that in. Because remember the multi the norm the multiplier norm is just the norm of the operator. And in this case, the operator is the partial sum operator. Now, the, at this point, this is almost just a, the same thing in different notation. But we can leverage um, something called a transference technique, which is the next topic, to study the discrete multiplier by using Fourier transforms on Rn. So we add. So this is where the 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 usual definition of a multiplier which you might be more familiar with comes from so an l infinity function on rn is a p multiplier as before if the operator is defined in the same fashion we take f now we fourier transform we multiply by m and undo the fourier transform so this is bounded as a function, uh, as a map from LP, this time on Rn, not Zn, to LP. And we then say that M is a mod, is in the space MP of Rn. And we similarly associate it with a norm, which is just the norm of the corresponding operator in LP. Right, so we've got these very similar definitions, one for function Rn, one for functions on the torus. And they're not accidentally called in the same way. They basically are interchangeable. Provided the functions are nice enough, we can swap back and forth between them. And those are the results that are typically called transference. So here are two such theorems. Next. So where's the first one? So the sort of more straightforward one is that if M is nice enough, never mind what the actual condition is, and M is in MP, so that's the R is an R in multiplier, then the multiplier that's obtained by sampling it at lattice points, right? So this is the this is now Z multiplier. This is uniformly in the space of Z multipliers. As we can simultaneously control all of these norms for all n by using the norm of n as an R n multiplier. So if you like, this is, if M is in Rn, then the lattice rescalings form a multiplier for the torus. Right, just take a multiplier, look at it on the torus, it's still a multiplier. And there's the converse result. So the converse result is slightly different. You can't just take a function, look at it on the, on the lattice and extract information about Rn because the lattice has major zero. But if you've got a stronger assumption, which is M is again nice, although nice is just Riemann integrable and bounded. And we know that the, the sampled function is a torus multiplier uniformly in N, so this inequality holds, then 
we can recover that the original function n is a multiplier in for r, for rn and the Fourier transform. Okay, so now we've we've managed to reduce the problem of convergence of the circular means. So circular means converge in F in LP to the question of whether the bull is a multiplier on RN. So just above, uh, see if I can get that in the picture. Okay, so if this loads just above, we've seen that LP convergence was equivalent to the uniform bounding, boundedness of the sampled ball as a sequence multiplier, multiplying the torus. And using the transference results, that's equivalent to the actual function, the multiplier, sorry, the, the indicator for the ball being a multiplier on Rn for the Fourier transform. So this gives us another line of attack for the question of the convergence of the circular truncations. And I mean, it's successful, but um, not, not, what, not what we were hoping for. So the result of Pfefferman, 1971, is that for any n greater than or equal to two, and any p that's not two, the ball is not a multiplier. So it's, a, it's enough to prove this for two dimensions because if you've got a multiply in n plus one and you restrict to n coordinates only, that's still a multiply. And as for p, p equals two is a Hilbert space, so that's always going to work. Um, you can't really not have that. But if you try to look for any other value of p that's not the, the Hilbert space case, it doesn't work. So for our purposes, this means that in all dimensions that aren't one and for all values of p that aren't two, there's some LP function such that the circular partial sums don't converge to F in LP. Okay. So just to sum up the upshot here, unfortunate choice of words, so we have for n equals one and any p that's not one or infinity, we get convergence in LP for all f. And there's only one way to, to look at the partial sum, so there's no ambiguity there, and that just works. For n greater than or equal to two, and all of these values of p, the square mode of truncation will converge back to f in lp for all f but if you try to look at the circular mode of truncation this will not converge to f in lp in general so we've got two extremes if you look at if you take a square choice you can get all the conversion that you, you want to expect. If you, for whatever reason, try to pick the points in a circle, then you don't get any convergence guaranteed whatsoever other than the Hilbert space case. So that's, all of this is known, um, and I, I'm not, I can't really present any new results anywhere in this direction, but this question came up in a, paper of Pfefferman, Hajduk, and Robinson, my supervisor. So that's 2019. So, so what if we take eigenfunctions, say W for some operator, is there some choice of sets En that will fill out the lattice, such that the partial sums of this form, where we only sample in the sets 
the, the good sets, conversion W, and such that the partial sums are uniformly bounded. And these aren't necessarily Fourier modes. So already the equivalence between these two is a bit thornier because, um, as I mentioned earlier, the uniform boundedness of the partial sums and the convergence is equivalent because we know that trigonometric polynomials are dense. For more general eigenfunctions, if the finite sums are not dense, then you can't recover the important implication, which is this one. So there's a more general question to be had here, but we lose out maybe a lot of the important techniques from Fourier analysis, like multiplier theory, etc., that allowed us to, to sort out the three cases listed above. So you can ask this question, it's important to ask this question, but it's a lot less clear how you'd even go about trying to, to do this for very general choice of Ws. So I think I won't abuse your time further. And um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. OK, let's just get a round of applause for Ryan in, in the camera before we stop the recording. Yeah. Thanks. OK, then I stop.